Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul J. in Baltimore. We're uh, doing another episode of Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News. And joining us to continue our discussion debate about President Obama's climate change policies, first of all, in London, Nafiz Ahmed is a best-selling author, investigative journalist, international security scholar. He's executive director of the Institute for Policy Research and Development, and he writes for The Guardian on geopolitics of the environment, energy, and economic crisis. He also writes at his Earth Insight blog. Also joining us in Seattle is David Roberts. He's a senior writer for Grist.org, where he covers climate change and energy politics, and he's written for Outside Magazine and Scientific American and many other publications. And uh, thank you both for joining us again. Thank you. So, so David, uh, let me start with you. We ended the first episode, and I think if you want, you should probably watch segment one if you haven't seen it yet, because we're just going to pick up where we were. You know, ask, asking the question, should President Obama, can he still, and well, let's start with, should he have, used his position to rally public opinion? Could he have been more effective if, in fact, this is what he wants? And, and, and let me, uh, David, let me ask you this. I mean, it seemed to me that the, the, the core of President Obama's climate change policies for, for much of his first term was cap-and-trade policies, which many people criticize as being just the financialization of the problem and not really a solution to climate change, more a way that Wall Street can make money out of the problem than anything else, and, 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 and that there was even although he ran in the 2008 election on the idea that, that the economic crisis and the, and the climate crisis were linked because the building of a green economy would be a solution to the economic crisis and the climate change crisis. And during those first two years, when they controlled both houses, we didn't hear a heck of a lot about it. And we, then we heard less and less about it, so we practically didn't hear President Obama talk about climate change at all. So, I mean, don't you think, as an administration, first of all, they bear some responsibility for the fact that public opinion isn't more clamoring for this kind of change? Well, you know, I want to be careful here, because when I, when I talk like this, I'm constantly accused of exonerating Obama and letting him off the hook and treating him like a passive player in politics. And, you know, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily true, but if you look at, for instance, let's talk about the bully pulpit. Let's talk about Obama's ability to shift U.S. public opinion. Right now, we are in a situation in U.S. politics of unprecedented historical polarization, very much two sides, like ships passing in the night. And there's a lot of political science research that shows that when the president, who is the leader of one of those sides— ultimately seen that way in D.C., seen that way by, by both parties, when he asserts himself in an issue and makes it a signature issue of his, it serves to further polarize it, is what happens. And that's what's happened to climate change. The more Democrats push for solutions, the more it becomes seen as a Democratic issue and the more the country becomes divided on it. So I don't think Obama actually... I mean, who knows what could happen, but I don't think Obama actually has the power or any modern U.S. president has the power to unite people. And I think, uh, honestly, their ability to do that has always been somewhat exaggerated. So, I mean, would I like Obama to give a lot more speeches about climate and, and, and lead a national teach-in and do radio side, you know, radio fireside addresses, all that? Sure, I would love it. But I think we need to be realistic about his ability to unite a very, very divided and polarized country about this. So that's first of all. Second of all, I don't want to get in, uh, you know, sink down the cap and trade debate rat hole, which I spent years of my life in. But suffice to say, if Obama and the Democrats had been able to pass that cap and trade plan that they originally proposed, the original uh, uh, Waxman Markey bill in the House that passed the House of Representatives, we would be in a much, much, much better position. It was a much better policy than it's generally given credit for. Can I just ask but a the quick reason question? Can I, David, David, just, David, just one sec. Did President Obama support that bill? Because I thought that wasn't really his uh, favorite well, bill. This is, it, it, he supported the bill notionally. He didn't really get out and fight for it because at the time he was fighting for stimulus, he was fighting for health care. I mean, ultimately, the decision to put health care first in line ahead of climate change sort of you know, saying climate change is chances. But I think arguably, given the U.S. Congress that we have today, there's no way that plan, there's no way the cap and trade plan could have passed. It passed the House barely and then just died an ignominious death in the Senate. And I don't, you know, 
given the structural forces we've been talking about, I don't know that more participation by Obama could have really swung okay. things okay. one way or the other. I think yeah. what you have to, I think you just have to acknowledge that current U.S. politics, as reflected in the current U.S. Congress, is not prepared to deal with this. And, and until the, the people start pushing Congress differently and until, uh, you know, there's less influence by concentrated money and corporate power in Congress, you're not going to have uh, you're not going to have that movement. So that's what has to change. Yeah, if me, Congress me, swung me, around, me, I know David, Obama David, would be. David, let me bring Nafiz in here. Nafiz, uh, if you go to my memory, you go back to 2008 when President or 2009 when President Obama is inaugurated. Uh, the crash, of course, is, is is paramount. But during the whole lead up in the election in 2008 and 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 even in 2009, the, even the mass media was all about climate change. Everybody, there was a, a few months there where there was nothing but climate change in, in the mainstream media. Uh, there was a lot of public opinion for doing something. Uh, he got elected with this idea of the convergence of the solution, a green solution to the economic crisis. And then we didn't hear a heck of a lot about it after that. I mean, what do you, what do you make of that issue that he just was, he's dealing with real politic and... And, and that's that. And again, let me say again, for people to watch the first episode, I'm not suggesting this is all about President Obama. Quite the opposite. I'm saying the interests that he represents aren't all that interested in really taking on climate change. Yeah, I think this is, I mean, I think, um, I, 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 you know, when, when all of that was going on, I, I, I didn't expect it to actually transpire. Um, and that's because I knew who was funding Obama's campaign. And I think a lot of people knew he was funding Obama's campaign, were equally sceptical. So it wasn't really kind of a big surprise hoo-ha moment when, you know, we find that actually there is a very fundamental commitment to continued fossil fuel extraction. And a lot of the, a lot, a lot of less effort put into promises around the green economy, you know, cap and trade and all the rest of it. It's worth bearing in mind also that even if you look at the cap and trade stuff at face value and you look at the kind of the whole carbon market style solution to the crisis. I mean, there's a lot of studies. I mean, there's one study by Deutsche Bank, which really, really kind of criticized um, this way of dealing with, with the problem in any case. So I'm not entirely convinced that that bill would have um, put us in a better place. I might be wrong, but we, well, obviously there's no point. We don't know that now. But I mean, getting back down to the issue of really Obama's role in this, I think, I think at the end of the day, you know, a political leader does have to take responsibility for their actions, ultimately. Whether or not they're constrained by institutions, whether or not they're constrained by the systemic power and money, I think reality is that you know Obama is a person who knows what he's doing. He's an intelligent man. He's obviously clearly he's obviously responsible for his actions, and I do consider to him to be responsible for the, um, his role in 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 kind of fudging a lot of a lot, a lot of the um, a lot of the issues around around what has how, how much the United States has fallen from its from its rhetoric over the last few years from his campaign rhetoric and, and how different the plan that we have now is to, compared to that rhetoric. Um, but at the same time, I think it would be naive to simply just say, you know, and, and, and actually I, I think in, in, that, and in that sense, you know, given that, you know, so I think David is a lot more sympathetic to Obama than I am. But I think this is where, when you look at this issue, of, and, I, and I think uh, you know, this is why this debate is so important, that it, it can sometimes be very polarizing to simply focus on the man when we when, and then a, a, a kind of encourages us to avoid looking at why it is that this man is failing so dismally in this context. And I think it comes down to the fact that ultimately Obama's administration, I mean, let's say in a kind of blunt tabloid style way, bought and sold by, by the fossil fuel lobby. Um, and that's really the fundamental problem. And, and so even though David and I might come from different ends of the political spectrum in terms of Obama, we still end up at this fundamental issue, which is look at the nature of the US political scene, look at the systemic issues, look at the money and the power. That, that is ultimately the problem of Obama's administration, is that, that even though he's a different administration from the Republican administration, and there are nuances and there are differences, and there is certainly more interest in climate change on, on the part of the Democrats, but fundamentally it hasn't given us what we need to take us off this trajectory. So we really do need to look at developing how, how can we get people on the streets? How can we get a grassroots movement which is which is ready to kind of hold people, hold President Obama, hold other politicians to account and say that actually we're really fed up and we're not happy with this.
Let's do a whole segment about that another day, because that is a big topic, and I know everybody watching this is going to want to have a, 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 an in-depth discussion about that. Uh, we just did a series with Chris Hedges, which kind of dealt some with some of the problems of uh, how does a mass movement on these issues get going, or at least develop on a bigger scale than it is. But, but uh, d just to be fair with President Obama and his administration, because I'm, I'm, my role so far has been to go after him more than you guys. But at any rate, let's say whatever, I, you know, given the systemic issues, given the importance of some big solution, and given that it's not going to happen right now, David, tell us some of the small things he plans to do that are worth doing, that, that, that at least made sure. you say this is worth something. Sure, sure. Well, the, the biggest thing in his plan by far is uh, regulations on existing coal-fired power plants. I really think, you know, in my endless quest to make climate change policy simple for people, I think one of the sort of simple things that people should remember is climate change is coal. Coal is climate change. It's coal, cars, and cows. But coal in the U.S. is the big problem. And right now we have a large fleet of very old, very dirty coal plants that have no uh, restrictions on their carbon dioxide emissions whatsoever. So finally, EPA is, per, per the law, per uh, uh, what the Supreme Court said, going to regulate CO2 from coal plants. Now, Obama did not say in his speech anything about the stringency of those regulations. So they could be weak, they could be strong. We don't know yet, but strong regulations on CO2 emissions from coal plants would be by far the biggest accomplishment on climate change in Obama's uh, uh, term. So that's, that's the big thing. But there are other things, too. There are more uh, increases in fuel efficiency for vehicles, which was a huge thing he did his first term, which I don't think he gets enough credit for. And then if you dig it down in the plan, there's all sorts of little stuff, like there's a lot of things about helping farmers deal with drought, with adaptation, with getting cities starting to talk to each other and prepare for climate adaptation. There's uh, a really important piece about the U.S. saying it will no longer uh, fund foreign coal plants, and the World Bank recently followed up on that and said it's going to stop financing uh, coal plants abroad, and that's a big piece. So a lot of this stuff is just moving the pieces of the federal apparatus in such a way as to, to lay the groundwork, I think, is a good way of looking at this, is a lot of this is laying the groundwork right. for future changes. And you really have to get down in the machine and crank the gears and start getting people in the bureaucracy thinking about this and incorporating climate change and climate pollution into their day-to-day -day decisions. And that's the sort of soil out of which uh, a bigger change will grow. And so I don't think he really he's getting enough credit a lot of what needs to be done on this really is not a big, you know, grand dramatic gesture. It's just mucking around in the machine and changing sort of the day-to-day -day operation of the federal bureaucracy. And that's what most of the plan uh, was devoted to. It's not sexy. It's not, right. you know, it's not headline stuff. Okay. But it's important work. Nafiz. Well, you know, I think I think it's important to recognize that when something good is done, that you accept it and you say, well, this is a good thing. However, I think we do need to give ourselves a reality check uh, and remember that, you know, in the next few decades, we're looking at major transformations um, in the climate system, which will undermine food production, lead to massive water scarcity, um, which will really challenge everything that we are used to in our Western way of life. Um, and this is, this is, we're already seeing the effects of this in things like the Arab Spring and other, and other kinds of issues that are going on, other kinds of challenges and problems we've, we've already seen all over the world. So I think the reality check is, is that we're, we're headed for an uninhabitable planet um, before the end of this century, in my view. Um, and that's, that's what the majority of climate scientists say. And unfortunately, all of everything we've got on the table right now is just not enough. So while I think it's, it, is, it is important, because it is really important, actually, to recognize when government and when politics does do good stuff, because if you just poo pooed it completely, you, you know, you wouldn't, you'd just not be getting anywhere. But at the same time, it's equally important to basically say, but this is like nothing compared to what we really need to be doing. And if we don't say that, then we're also not, we're not, we're also being complicit in this juggernaut, which is heading towards absolute catastrophe for us, our children and our grandchildren. So we need to, we need to kind of welcome you know, baby steps, we also need to basically really be pushing 
for a lot, lot more radical systemic change. Okay, so what we'll do is uh, sometime in a few weeks, we'll reconvene this panel, maybe we'll add a person or two to it, uh, and we'll start a whole series uh, on why there isn't a bigger movement demanding more uh, uh, dramatic grand gestures on climate change. Uh, there's a poll that just came out which uh, apparently says that 75% of Americans under the age of 35 think that climate skeptics are crazy. Uh, and in other words, accept that there is a real climate change crisis and that it's human caused. I'm not suggesting climate skeptics are crazy. I am quoting a poll. Uh, all right, but, but, but if that's the case, then, and if people, and if 75% of people under 35 believe all this, then they're not on the streets about it. So uh, that's the question we'll take up in a few weeks. So gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having us. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. And don't forget, we're in our uh, summer fundraising campaign. If you want to see more of this kind of discussion and debate and more coverage on climate change, which I have to admit is maybe the weakest area of our work at the moment and something we need and will be paying much more attention to, uh, then, but we, we need money to do it. So there's somewhere around here is a, a donate button. And for every dollar you donate, it's going to get matched. So thank you again for joining us on The Real News Network.